start recording. Um, and uh, Francesco, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you again. And then after Francesco's presentation, of course, we will have some Q&A uh, time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having called me. And I'm very happy of being here and being part of this project and this experiment. And yeah, the essence of this um, of this presentation will be actually, I will give you some information, but actually I would really like you to bomb me of questions and, and everything, single doubt or curiosity you have about the curious opportunities in you. So the first, in the first part the floor is mine, but I would really like that in the second part, the floor will be yours and you will ask me everything you have in mind about that. Okay, I will start um, to share my screen. Um, I hope it works. Okay, can you see the presentation? Yes. 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 Okay, perfect. Uh, the very first thing I want to tell you is uh, that it would that uh, how it was said I am the careers ambassador for the University of Trento so I'm here tonight to answer your questions but I'm always here to answer your questions so please don't hesitate to write me uh, an email or a whatsapp message or to call me you can find all my contacts on the uh, uh, job guidance website uh, the careers in the EU section so Please don't hesitate. If you have any curiosity, any doubts, please uh, contact me. I will be very happy of answering you and try to assist you. Uh, also, if you need uh, sort of personal assistance, if you, are, if you are applying for a specific competition. So tonight, but always. And, but what is that? So first of all, so we will have a look at those uh, careers opportunities, what it means to work for European institutions, our selection procedures are organized and also some information about traineeship opportunities. But first of all, what is EPSO? EPSO is the European Personnel Selection Office and it is the office of the European Commission responsible for the organization of the selection procedures. And in this phrase, there is already a very important information. EPSO is responsible for the organization of selection procedures, but does not recruit themselves the staff it selects. Okay, so we will see very soon that the very first part of the selection, uh, the very first three stages of, of the selection are managed by EPSO, but the real recruitment of the employees is made by every single institution, as we will see very soon. Where can a new career lead? Uh, you're studying international relations, so you, uh, I'm sure you already know very well all those institutions. We have the parliament, we have the council, we have the commission, we have the ECJ, uh, we have the Court of Auditors, we have the EAS. So a lot of different institutions dealing with a lot of different uh, matters and subjects. And to work in all these uh, different institutions, every single type of profile is required. Uh, generally, people think that uh, European institutions are open just to lawyers or economists, but it's not like that, okay? We have translators, we have scientists, we have interpreters, we have communication specialists, we have everyone. Uh, but these slides give you also another important technical information, uh, which is that while applying for a, a position in, uh, in the European institution, you're not actually applying for a specific job position, but you're applying for a profile. What I mean is that generally, when you do make an application to be hired in a company, okay, you maybe you send your curriculum and you send your motivational letter and you already know which specific position you will cover in that company. Uh, maybe it will be your colleagues, uh, what will be the matters you will be dealing with. This is not the case for the European institutions. Generally, or in the greatest majority of the cases, you will be applying for a profile. For example, economist. You apply for that profile, 
you have a certain type of test, and then you will be inserted in a list if you are successful, of course, in the very first steps of the selection. And then every single European institution who have a vacancy in the profile you have applied for may select you and call you and offer you a specific job, okay? A specific job position. But till that moment, you're, you don't know exactly what kind of job you will be doing in the European institution, right? But you're just applying for a profile. A generic, a general profile. I'm sorry. Okay, can you see the presentation now? Yes. 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 Okay. I had a technical problem. And okay. Um, so you're actually applying for a profile. There may be cases in which you're applying for a specific job positions, but all those cases are limited to generally temporary positions, so temporary contracts and not permanent positions. For permanent positions, you will be applying for a profile. Who are we looking for? So what are the general and the basic requirements to get a job in the European institutions? First of all, you have to be an EU citizen. Uh, this is a fundamental requirement. Uh, just for some traineeship opportunities, uh, you can also be a non-EU citizen, but generally to have a permanent job positions inside the European institutions, you have to be an EU citizen. You have to know minimum two EU official languages. Uh, the first one could be preferably Italian and the second one depends. In some cases can be uh, one other official languages and it doesn't matter uh, what actually official languages it would be. Uh, in other cases, you would be asked to know a procedural languages, which means English, French, or German, or some other specific languages because maybe they are requiring personnel working in a specific context. So they need you to know a specific language. And some other times, uh, the minimum languages knowledge required will not two languages will not be two languages, but three languages. This is the case of uh, translators, interpreters, lower linguists, uh, and other kind of countries like, like this, but generally dealing with translation. Uh, you will be, has to be available working in a multicultural teams. Uh, it's a requirement to get a job inside a European institution, but it's also an opportunity that the European institution give you because, um, it's also an advantage having the possibility of working in such an environment. And there are opportunities both for graduates and non-graduates. We will see uh, which is the difference actually in, in the graduates grades and non-graduates grades. On the other side, what do we offer? First of all, an interesting and challenging work. With your job inside a European institution, you can really make the difference in the life of more than 500 million European citizens. So uh, you are actually in the heart of the European life, in the heart of the European policy making, and it's a unique opportunity and it's really a very challenging job. You will have an international working environment, as we said before. You will have a great opportunity for traveling, especially if you work for um, institution like the, or organs like the EEAS, and shaping Europe together. Shaping Europe together is actually the motto of EPSO, but I think that is maybe the best motivation uh, that should bring you having the desire of working inside a European institution. It should be the spirit uh, that moves you to, to wish a future in the European institutions, because working in the European institution really gives you the possibility of giving your contribution in building this Europe, of, of, on, on building the future of our Europe, of shaping this Europe together, actually. It is, is beautiful because you know that you're not working for the, for the profit of a private company, but you're actually working for the benefits of millions of European people. And again, what do you offer? Uh, personal development training courses. You know that the environment inside the European institutions is an environment that encourages you to develop and learn new skills and language every single day of your working uh, life. 
So you will have a lot of different courses like languages, but also IT skills, public speaking, leading a team, negotiation skills, cybersecurity, management skills, cultural training. I'm just saying some of them, right? But there are a lot. Also because inside the European institutions, there is a great job mobility. Um, the greatest majority of the functionaries I talked to this month, uh, like none of them remains in the same institution or DG or office for more than 10 years. Uh, they, they, they change a lot of different position, a lot of different institutions. Maybe they became officers dealing with a specific matters or with a specific profile. And then they also completely change profile during their career. And this is wonderful because you always have the opportunity of uh, renewing your, your experience. And of course the European institution give you all the skill and all the knowledge necessary to do this. There is a good work-life balance. You have flex time possibility, the possibility to work part-time. You've got telework, you've got parental leaves, et cetera. Of course, also depending by your family situation. And also well-being initiatives. Uh, some functionaries told me that in their DG, on the, in their office, um, something like yoga courses or fitness classes were organized maybe during lunch time. It's something that really helps the cohesion between colleagues, but also makes your working day lighter. And it's, and it's a pretty uh, good environment. Um, of course, this is one other explication of this a good work-life balance. So I checked the salaries in the next slides. We will see uh, some, uh, some tabs that shows you the, the different salaries corresponding to the different position and the different grades. And you will see that this is, these are actually attractive. A good pension scheme, family child allowances, European schools, and medical insurance. So a lot of advantages also under this point of view. But how can you get a job uh, inside the European institution? Which are the selection procedures? Which are the procedures you have to follow to get a job inside the European institutions? The very first step is EFSO website, www.efso.europa.eu. You can visit this website, this website and uh, this, this page will open up to you. You can see that there is a, a black bar on the top. You click on job opportunities, a slide comes down and you will see the list of every single open position in the European institution. You can click on them, you can see uh, some information and then there is the possibility to apply online. Remember that the online application is the just possibility you have to have access to those job positions, okay? Just applications via uh, EFSO website. So the very first thing you have to do is create a, an EFSO account, a personal account. Through this account, you will receive all the information related to your application. So the invitation to book a test, the test results, and every other information that could be useful and related to your application. There are too many types of selections. The competitions or concours, it is dedicated to permanent officials. So if you want to become a permanent official with a permanent contract, you have to follow this way. While we have CAST, uh, which are dedicated to contract agents, uh, we will see who, who they are in the next slides. Uh, they are uh, personnel and employees employed for with a three-year contract, which is renewable once. And the procedures is pretty, diff is pretty different. Okay, let's see, first of all, competition for permanent officials. Um, as I was mentioning you before, uh, permanent officials are divided in two great categories, assistants and administrators. Assistants is the personnel who does not have a university degree or who is not required to have a university degree. They go from AST 1 to AST 9 grades and to, to apply for this job position, actually, you don't need any university degree, but you just need maybe a high school diploma, uh, and in some cases, uh, working experience in a specific field. While we have administrators, uh, they go from AD5 to AD16 grades, 
And to, in order to apply for this position, you need uh, a university degree, more specifically to uh, apply for an AD5 grade, which is actually the entry level. You just need to have a bachelor degree. To apply for an AD6 uh, grade application, you need at least a bachelor degree and three years of working experience. And from AD7 grade, you need at least a bachelor degree and six years of working experience. What you see here is a simplified diagram of the structure of the competition. So a general overview of the competition uh, from the moment in which you create your extra account and you click on apply now on the EPSO website through the moment in which you are uh, inserted in the list of successful candidates, which not means that you will be uh, employed for sure, but it means that you uh, successfully passed all those steps of the selection, which are actually the ones organized by uh, EPSO. After this stage, uh, the balls goes to actually uh, the, the single institutions. So let's see uh, more in detail every single stage. The first stage is the pre-selection computer-based test or CBT. And it's something like the test you have to do uh, for, for your university admission, right? So you have verbal reasoning, rhetorical reasoning, abstract reasoning, uh, reading comprehension, all this, okay? Some very simple exercises that you can solve in a couple of minutes. The problem actually at this stage is that you don't have a couple of minutes, right? Because your great enemy at that stage is time. You have to consider that the 95% of the applicants are eliminated at, the, at that stage. So, uh, believe me train 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 and train with those exercises do them do them do them and do them again before trying this test uh, there are also some sample tests on uh EPSO website you can download them and try to to do them and improve uh, your ability in solving them because actually believe me the greatest selection is made at that stage there's also some examples of the test this is Verbal reasoning. Okay, there are some questions related to the text. This is numerical reasoning. And this is absolute reasoning. So, what would be the next image? Okay. Um, if you are one of those uh, get the highest, the highest marks in the first step, you will be invited to step two, which is actually the intimidate test. If the first test is in your first language, so for example in Italian, and you can do it everywhere in the world, uh, I mean in the world, so if you, for example, in a period in the United States, so you want to apply for um, an EPSO uh, competition, uh, you can check if there is any uh, center, EPSO center, where you are in the United States and maybe book a test also over there. This test is actually in your second language. So for example, English is if it's the second language you selected. And at that stage will be valued your language competences. So language comprehension questions, translations and so on. And there will be some specific questions about the specific profile you, were, you are applying for. So if you are applying for an economist profile, you will have questions about economy, finance, and maybe law. Again, uh, if you obtain uh, one of the highest marks in that stage, you will be invited to stage three, which is actually the assessment center in Brussels or Luxembourg. Um, if the prior stage um, evaluates your knowledge at that stage are evaluate your skills. Um, this stage actually has uh, a very complicated structure because you could have an oral presentation. We will be, you could be asked to give an oral presentation. You could be asked to have a one-to-one -one interview. 
and you can be put in a group of other applicants and you will be given assignments and they ask you to work on, on this assignment. And then there will be someone who uh, looks at you while you're working in group with the other trainees and in the meanwhile, they evaluate you. So like uh, something like uh, Big Brother uh, on, on that stage. Actually, there are eight competencies evaluates at the assessment center, analysis and problem solving, communication, delivering quality and results, uh, learning and development, prioritizing and organizing, resilience. Uh, those tests can be also stressful. So uh, res your resilience will be evaluated. Uh, your ability in working with others, this is very important. Working in teams is something fundamental to, to work in in the European institutions, and maybe also your potential to lead. So to get a job in, in, inside the European institution, it's very important that you have these eight competences, okay? Because these are the bases. Um, okay, you need the knowledge, you need the prior experience, you need a good CV, but you need competences because then you will be employed in a certain office, in a certain uh, DG, um, you will be employed working on a specific project and you have to use your competencies. You will have to, to know how to translate your knowledge in, in fact. Okay. Of course, the situation we are living right now uh, pretty changed all those scheme I just presented you. Uh, so while CBT tests are ongoing, so the very first stage of your um, of your application is preserved and you can book them and make those tests. Um, of course, in taking into consideration the different rules and in different states and different member states and also other, other places, you will be doing and booking this test. Uh, but they are actually generally preserved and they are going on. The, the, the greatest difference are about the assessment center tests because uh, as I just told you, uh, those, uh, those phases before were essentially in presence in Luxembourg or in Brussels. And, and now it is not possible to organize this kind of, this kind of uh, evaluation. So EPSO had to suspend all these assessment center activities and they are now working on doing this test online. But you will find all the information on EFSA website. So don't worry, you will be uh, always updated about new, new opportunity, new, new, new rules uh, concerning the situation of coronavirus. Okay, what happens if you pass all those three stages? So if you get one, or the highest marks also in the assessment center uh, stage. Uh, following the competition, the selection board uh, draws up a list. Okay. And there is this reserve list that contains the names of successful candidates. Then the list is available to every single European institution, which are the solely responsible for recruiting new staff from, from this reserve list. So here the, the job of EPSO stops and the European institution will be responsible for selecting you. Uh, the institution receives also document known as competency passport, uh, setting out your performance at the assessment center, okay, which is very important as I told you before. And then of course they have your CV, they have everything about you. And if you're, uh, position, if your experience, if your career uh, is of interest for them and they have a vacancy in the profile you applied for, they can contact you and, and offer you a job. Please keep in mind a couple of things. First of all, the list of successful candidates is valid generally for at least one year, but can be renewed. So generally it is renewed and don't worry. But what is important that being on the list of successful candidate doesn't mean that you will get a job for sure or that you will be offered a job for sure. It means that you are inserted in that list, but then every single institutions have 
have this solely, uh, this, they solely have this competence of uh, choosing between successful candidates who they uh, consider uh, the best for a specific job position. And in that case, you will be contact, you will be contact. Uh, they will offer you a specific job position that time and not something concerning with your profile generally, but a specific job position. You will have a job interview with them. And if you pass this job interview, you can whether decide to accept this, this offer, and then you will have a contract signed and you will become and you will become a permanent official, or you can refuse this uh, this proposal and you will be put again in the reserve list. So it is not that if you uh, refuse the proposal, it's you, you have to do everything for, for the, from the beginning. You will be inserted again inside the reserve list. Okay, uh, the one you see here is the list of the upcoming opportunities. So there are some of the opportunities available right now. And as you can see, you, you find the field, which is actually the profile. Uh, you can find the languages you have to know to apply for this position. You know that in some cases, uh, some specific languages are required. You will find the grades that it's the one I told you before. So AD7, it's administrators at grade seven. It means that you have to, to have a bachelor degree and at least six years of working experience to apply for this. While the next one, for example, is an AD5. It means that you just need a bachelor degree and you will see also assistant AST. If you find SC, it stands for secretaries and they are the equivalent of the assistants. So uh, they are valid as the same, the same requirements uh, are valid and required for the assistants. Okay, this is actually the tab of the base salaries I was uh, telling you about before. You, you see that um, an entry um, level a graduate uh, earns more or less 4.9 thousand euros per month. So it's a pretty attractive salary. And also a secretary or an assistant is uh, get more or less 2.6 thousand euros uh, per month. So, okay, then there is also all the profile the tax about taxation, but it actually remains a very attractive salary. Okay, other staff. Um, as I told you before, we have uh, permanent staff and other kind of staff, which is which are actually contract agents, temporary agents, interim staff, freelancers also, uh, second national experts. We come from the National Public Administration and trainees. Um, tonight, we will concentrate on contract agents and trainees. So contract agents are. Uh, is all the personnel employed in, in the fields where the EU institution uh, have not enough permanent official to, to deal with certain skills and certain matters. So it's generally a, a very uh, specialized personnel and which is put in, in to deal with situation when with matters uh, about which the European institution don't have enough personnel or uh, enough qualified personnel to deal with. Francesco, we don't hear you.
Francesco. Forse è da fare, mamma. Francesco. Okay, so this is the, the slide, the last slide you saw, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so now we saw all the selection procedure for the permanent officials, but European institution um, employ also other kind of staff. We have counter agents, we have temporary agents, we have interim staff, we have also freelancers, we have second national experts who come from national administrations, and we have trainees. Uh, tonight we will concentrate on counter agents and trainees. Um, counter agents uh, are specialized personnel employed by the European institutions in the field where there are not enough permanent official. Uh, to deal with the required skills, okay? With required skills. So it's actually a specialized personnel uh, that implements the, all the staff of the European institution when they don't have uh, specialized permanent personnel to deal with certain matters. Um, they have a three-year contract, uh, which is renewable once, so for a maximum of six years. There are some very specific and limited number of profiles you can apply for as a contest agent. And here you can see the, the list, but you will find it also on the EPSO website. And this is the selection procedure for contest agents. Um, there's the open registration period, always online, so through EPSO website. And then there is a pre-selection by the recruiting services this time. So we'll be uh, first of all, in contact with the institution, the single institution, then um, if you pass this pre-selection by the single institution, you will be sent to EPSO for uh, some different tests who are similar to the one I showed you before, but are not actually the same. And there is not the assessment sensor phase. And then you're sent back to the institution who eventually will actually recruit uh, you. So. The, the, the basic difference between this uh, procedure and the previous one is that in that procedure, uh, you are, first of all, in contact with the single institution and not with that. So, okay, this is a list of the salaries for contract agents. And then we come to talk about traineeships. Uh, every single European institution offers traineeship opportunities. And, but actually, uh, they are not centralized, which means uh, that every single institution organizes its own traineeship programs. And so the selection procedure for traineeships is not centralized and managed by EPSO, but every single European institution has its own rules and its own procedures. Anyway, on EPSO website, you can find um, all the, the open positions. Okay, you should find all the greatest position, all the open position, because actually, because of the fact, as and as, as I said, that um, the 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 single opportunities are managed by the single institutions. It's better always if you double check the EPSO website and the website of the single institution. But anyway, you will find this page on the EPSO website. So clicking on the black bar I showed you before, and clicking on traineeships you will find this page with a lot of boxes and inside of every box, there is a name of an institution. And if you click on this box, you will see if there is any open traineeship position for that institutions. You will find some information about this, this opportunity and uh, you will most importantly find uh, the, the link to the website of, a, of that institution where you will find all the information related to this traineeship. Very, very important before applying, make sure you consult the rules of the traineeship. You can find them in files under the name of rules, um, notice, notice of competitions, or also decisions. So if you find 
a file attached uh, with a name like decision number, uh, this may be the rules of the traineeship. And it is very important because here you really have all the official conditions and you have all the rules concerning every single profile and aspect of your traineeship, which is uh, from the, the selection criteria to the medical insurance, uh, to the leaves. So everything really consult these documents before applying. This is an example of a traineeship opportunity. This is the, book, the Blue Book traineeship, uh, which is organized by the commission, is one of the greatest traineeship programs in the European institutions. It, it involves like 1.8 thousand trainees a year, and it is paid more or less 1.2 thousand euros per month, and it's located in Brussels, Luxembourg, and all the representation of the European commissions. There is really a, a nice number of applicants, so the the, um, the competition is very challenging. Who can apply? You need to have a bachelor degree. You have to know minimum two EU languages, one of which must be a procedural language. So English, French, or German. There is no need, uh, no EU citizenship needed that time. So this is one of the case we have an exception, but I have to tell you that uh, uh, post reserve to Non-EU citizenship and non-EU citizens are very limited. So also in this case, there is a very hard competition and there is no age limit. And while the criteria and the requirement you see on the bottom right, so no prior EU employment to more than six weeks is actually a common criteria to like all the traineeship opportunities in the EU institution. So you don't need to have any prior EU employment. It means having not worked for any EU institution, office, organ, representation, or uh, delegation, or everything for more than six weeks. And it includes both um, employments, so uh, being a permanent official or a temporary agent or a concert agent, but also traineeship opportunities. So you don't have to be employed in any way in any institution organ office and so on for more than six weeks this is a very common criteria for like every single uh, traineeship uh, competition because of course there is this rotation principle according to which they want to give the the opportunity to make a traineeship to the most of the of the people possible okay uh, one very last information. Um, generally, uh, while having, having done a traineeship in, in the European institution does not give you the opportunity to be directly hired, to be directly hired or, or employed by the European institutions, right? Um, so when the, the traineeship finishes, it's finished. So you, if you want to become a, a functionaire, you actually have to make a concours. And, but, but there are some exceptions. And one of those exceptions is the junior professional program. And it is open only to the commission staff. So only if you do a blue book traineeship. And, and if you are very excellent during, during your traineeship, uh, you can be noticed by your, your, uh, your, your tutor and you can be uh, sent to uh, internal competition uh, to, to, become, to become a permanent official. Uh, more precisely, you would be offered a contract as a temporary agent for 30 months at the AD5 grade. And then you will join a mobility program with two consecutive assignments in two different director generals before returning to the service of origin. And in parallel, you will have the participation in a specific training program and the possibility to take part in the internal competition I was telling you before, to access to the EU civil service. So become a permanent official. But uh, this, this program is actually open just for uh, 50, 50 trainees a year. So 50 trainees, over 1.8 thousand. So they're very limited 
a number of trainees who are actually selected for this program and have the possibility to become um, permanent official with a different procedures, which, which is not the concur. Okay, uh, that's all. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate. Uh, unmute yourself and ask me directly or write them down in the chat. So uh, don't be shy. And, but if you are shy, you can write me an email on the email address you can, you can find uh, in the job guidance website. And also don't forget to follow us on social network because we provide all, always updates and information about new competitions opens and new opportunities opens and new events in which me and the other Italian ambassadors are taking part. So uh, it could be an occasion to get more information. So follow us on, on social media. Uh, now, if you, if you have any question, here I am. Thank you, Francesco. Um, I don't know whether uh, our students who are not uh, shy at all uh, usually uh, are willing to ask uh, some questions, curiosities. Uh, I had uh, posted the link to the EU Careers uh, Italy uh, Facebook page on our uh, Facebook group. Uh, so most of them probably already knew uh, about this very useful uh, tool. Uh, so I don't know if you have questions. Are you there? Okay. Uh, Andrea? I see that you're talking, but I cannot yeah. hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I'm gonna break the ice. Uh, thank you, Francisco, for your presentation. And uh, I think most of us uh, here uh, already apply uh, for some traineeship uh, opportunities, especially okay. this one internship, traineeship. And uh, since we are uh, all, all here, uh, it means that we uh, most uh, like most of the times or always failed on it. So um, my question is uh, in our application, maybe I don't know in the motivational letter or in the CV, uh, if there is one thing that is uh, what's in your view, the must thing that uh, should be put inside our uh, you know, application forms when we apply for I mean, the, you provide a lot of information, but our, our, our question might be how to deal with the competition. What is the key, one of the key thing that okay. might... Um, okay, there is not a perfect or an ideal motivational letter, right? Because actually every institution has different criteria of evaluation and, and so it depends by the single institution. But one, one thing I can tell you is when you write a motivational letter or when you apply for a competition, uh, show them that you know something about them, right? That you know something about the project they're dealing with in that time, at that time, that you know the job they are doing, that you know what uh, they do, okay? Uh, because in that way, you are showing them that you're not applying for I don't know, the Schumann traineeship and a thousand, a lot of different things, maybe uh, writing always the same letter or all the, the same thing, but that you are applying for them because you're really interested in the job they are doing. You're really interested in becoming a trainee at the European Parliament in that case, um, about like um, the Schumann specifically, okay? Um, so make sure you, you give them information so that they can understand that you know something about them. If, for example, you are applying for a traineeship in the European Commission, that you have to select your DG, and before um, before writing the motivational letter, go on the website of that DG, uh, write down all the information you can achieve from that DG and the the, the project they're working on, and yeah, show them that you are interested, and also. Um, 
show them that you have some practical skills, okay? So that if they employ you, uh, you will be able to deliver results. So if you have experiences like you have organized events in your life or you've done something like this, write it down on your motivational letter because it's very very important because they are actually uh, trying to and they're actually looking for someone to employ in a specific field and they it is very important that they know that you have practical ability so and practical skills um even if, if you played in a football team or everything okay but write it down of course if you have more specific uh opportunities uh, mention the most specific opportunities also because the most of the times you have a uh, limited number of words you can use so made this selection but yeah this two things I, I i can say show them that you know something about them and show them that you have practical abilities and you have experience in your life that can show you that can show them that you can do something concretely You're welcome. Then, of course, I don't know if I answered your questions. If you have any other doubts, don't hesitate. I have, Francesco, two questions. Okay. Uh, the first one is about the spontaneous application. I don't know if you talked about that. I had to join the call a bit later. And more in particular, I would like to apply for a spontaneous application at the European Commission DG because uh, I heard that uh, that was a possibility, but uh, I never met anyone who actually was selected as an intern uh, through uh, a spontaneous application. Uh, the second question, uh, or do you prefer that I separate the two questions or you want me to? Okay. Don't worry, go on, go on. The second question is about uh, uh, doing an internship at the European Parliament with the MEP mm -hmm. uh, of uh, longer than six weeks. Because uh, I know that the rule is that you cannot do two internships at the, uh, at the European Union. But uh, uh, my question is, does this kind of uh, internship with an MEP and so not with the European Parliament, uh, yes. does, it, uh, uh, does it apply the same rule to, uh, the, to the normal internship? Thank you, Francesco. Okay. Uh, about spontaneous application, actually, I also never met anyone who was employed with spontaneous application so yeah you can try but i cannot give you any precise information because i never met anyone um uh, with with this application and the most of the time like for example with temporary agents um and the most of the cases i met people who had a, a really great job experience before they applied so maybe uh, they worked for important firms or companies, etc. And then in the end, they came to the European institutions. But in the end, they all made a conclusion as everyone else. And and I met no one with a spontaneous application. Maybe someone with cast, someone as temporary agents, but no one has spontaneous application. So actually, I also can give you any further information about that. About the traineeship as uh, members of the parliament, uh, it is a very uh, specific characteristic of the traineeship of the European Parliament. Maybe I can tell you something so that everyone can can enjoy of it. Um, you know that there are two possibilities uh, for for uh, experiencing a traineeship inside the European Parliament. The first one is the Schumann traineeship, which is actually at the administrative office. No, no, no. sorry, Francesco. No, no. My question is was just about uh, the limit of six weeks. Yes, yes, but when I was introducing the thing, because I don't know if all the others are aware of the just different possibilities. Okay, about your questions. Okay, uh, I don't know actually if every time it applies, but generally, generally, it, it doesn't mean that you, um, you, I mean, like you can do your traineeship with your MP, but then it depends by the single. Uh, application for other traineeships so what i want to say is that there is not a general rule that tells you if you have done this kind of traineeship you cannot apply for any other traineeship okay because actually the rule is not that you cannot do more than one traineeship experience okay but it is based on the numbers of weeks and this criteria depends on the single institution so some institutions um give you the possibility of making 
uh, second traineeship, also if you have done uh, another experience with an MP, okay? And some other institution does not permit you to. In this case, you have to take the rules of the single competition and read in the, in the paragraph, in the dedicated paragraph, what kind of the employment is considered uh, concerning this specific point, okay? They're always indicated. They can maintain you any institution and body of the European Union. And the most of the time is expressly specified even as MEP assistance. And in that case, it's sure that you cannot apply. In other cases, it is permitted. So there is not a general rule. It depends by the single criteria of the, series, of the single competitions you are applying for in the future. Some institution can permit it and some other cannot. It depends. And thank you. So yeah, it's it's a it's it's a case by case uh, possibility. You have to check it. And yeah, I was telling just something generally um, about this possibility in the European Parliament because I don't know actually if you know about that that there is the Schuman uh, traineeship program that is in the administrative offices of the European Parliament. But there is also this other opportunity inside the European Parliament so that you can do a traineeship associated as an assistant of an MEP. In this case, you don't have this selection procedure because every MEP selects its own assistants, of course, because uh, they have to trust you, I mean. <laughs> and, and okay, there is a possibility on the website of the Parliament in, in which you can. Um, give your availability and say, okay, I'm available to be an assistant of uh, an MEP and then you can be contacted and you can maybe also choose the MEP. But I have to tell you that the most of the times the MEP uh, selects someone of their uh, country of origin, member state of origin, and of course someone who is uh, making a political activity maybe associated with the parties, uh, with the party that the MEP belongs to. But there is also this possibility. If you know someone, uh, some MEP, or you have the occasion and you want to ask them, would you like to have me as your assistant at the European Parliament? This is a very wonderful opportunity because in that case, you can uh, really see from the insight um, how is the, the legislative procedure, maybe attending diplomatic events and also like all this, all this part of the political life of the European Union, which is very interesting. And it is actually a recognized um, uh, traineeship opportunity in the European institution. So if you have the chance, it's a very wonderful opportunity. Uh, maybe just one question about, uh, because uh thank you for the presentation by the way <laughs> sorry i was going straight to the point um no worry you you spoke briefly about the different positions that require uh some years of uh, already working experience um do the does the selection process uh pay some attention to what sort of working experience you have based on the sort of profile that you are applying for or is it more of a you have to have worked for X amount in, in whatever. Okay, uh, generally it works that way. If it's not specified so that they ask you a working experience in a certain field, every kind of job experience which respects the criteria. So there will be very precise rules about what is considered a work experience and what is not considered a work experience. So the most of the time, for example, traineeship opportunity, traineeships are not considered as uh, work experience. PhD may be considered as work experience, but for a maximum of three years and you have uh, completed, it, completed it on time. So there are very specific rules about what is considered working experience and what is not considered working experience. But generally, if it is not uh, expressly, uh, expressly required to have an experience in a certain field, any kind of job experience is valid to satisfy the basic requirements. Of course, when your curriculum will be analyzed by the, the recruitment offices of every single institution, of course, they will pay attention also to what kind of job experience you, you did. 
But okay, thank you. To, I was just wondering if, if it was categorized just for the entry or if it's then looked at. Uh, it for depends. The Generally, it is not. And in the case it is, uh, it is specified in the, in the application, in the competition, and in the rules. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. I have two questions in to ask is, if possible. Of course it is. So first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. The, the first question is, are there some institutes in Italy that prepares for the ESPO concourse? For example, I remember that the Institute of Politica, the ESP in Milan, prepared for the EPSO concourse, for example. And the second is more, one more personal question. So what piece of advice would you give to a, a young young student who wants to apply for a traineeship or a permanent, a permanent job at European Union? Okay. Uh, the first question is uh, one of the very few questions I cannot answer you because EFSO and the European Commission strongly forbid me to sponsorize any kind of schools which is not uh, actually recognized by by the European institutions so actually I cannot answer you and I there are schools yes there are books yes but I cannot tell you the name because it's something I cannot do in my position the just thing I can tell you is that there are simple uh, tests on the EFSA website but I cannot sponsorize any kind of books and schools but yes there are maybe in a private conversation <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I cannot sponsorize officially anything. And about your second question, it depends. It depends by, the, by your interest. And, and yeah, by the single institution you, you, you really wanna, you wanna apply for. And taking into consideration the, the limits, of the traineeship you can do. So choose it very carefully because once you did your, your opportunity, the most of the times you have exhausted all your, your, your chances. So generally you have the possibility of making, of having uh, one traineeship opportunity, one just one traineeship opportunity in your life. So choose it very carefully and I don't know what kind of general uh, advices I can give you. It depends if you have a specific requirements in, in a specific field, but yeah, general requirements, general advices, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, make experience, make a lot of experiences in your personal life, this yes, uh, because of course it's important your, um, your education backgrounds, but you know that the most of the applicants have the same application backgrounds because if there is a, a bachelor degree required, of course, everyone who, who applies has this bachelor degree and generally um, people who apply have the same educational background, really. They have studied maybe international relations, economy, law, and so on. So uh, take care of different kind of experiences you can do in your personal life that makes you different from other candidates. So try to, to do something in your personal life uh, aside your, your, your educational uh, career that can give you something different that no one else has. It doesn't mean that you have to become an astronaut and go <laughs> in the space tomorrow, but yeah, do some kind of experiences. Uh, we can also be association, uh, volunteering, everything kind of thing, but that makes you different from other candidates. And so it's motivation uh, for which they should choose you and not another one who have your same educational backgrounds because they are always very similar. That's one thing I can generally uh, tell to a student actually. Hi, Francesco. Can I can I ask a question? 
Of course you can. Uh, so you briefly mentioned PhDs and you said that they may or may not be considered as work experience at the end yes. of the PhDs. So, um, and you also said that at grade, like AD5 grade, you only need the bachelor degree, right? Without yes. any work experience. So if I do apply, like I'm doing a PhD, I'm in the second year. Um, okay. So if I do apply, um, obviously I cannot apply for an AD6 or AD7 until I finish my PhD. So which kind of other skills do they look for uh, on top of obviously a bachelor degree uh, or a master degree as I have or whatever, like which kind of specific skills? Because you now you just briefly mentioned like do experiences, like just do as many things as you can, uh, different kinds. But in terms of skills, what do you think, what do you reckon are the most valuable? And I would come back to the eight skills of the assessment center, maybe. Right. Uh, organizational, uh, delivering results, um, working with others, working in groups, and also, yeah, leading skills, uh, leadership, everything like this. It's very, very important. Communication, 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 communication. <laughs> how do you assess them? Like, how do you showcase these kind of skills to them like how do what do they look for because i mean it's always nice to write in the cv i have organizational skills because but it never works does it i mean yeah you have to prove this with something maybe you did and saying okay i've done this so i have organizational skills right. i've done this so i have communicational skills and of course, it depends also by the terms you use. Um, I have to tell you that, okay, the, the selection, okay, of the candidates sometimes is made also uh, by keywords. So they digit keywords on, on their database. And if that keywords is contained in your application, okay, your application comes uh, to their eyes. But if unfortunately, this keyword is not contained in your application or you're just use a synonym. Yeah. Uh, so it always, it also depends both by the experiences you had, the mm -hmm. concrete experiences you had, but also the, the terms you use and there is not a perfect rule. Also because it depends by the single person and, and, and the single, uh, I mean, uh, exigence of the of, of this of the institution at that time because when they have a vacancy it depends um, there is not a perfect profile a perfect curriculum a perfect uh, uh, career or or person if at that time they need a person with a specific skill uh, they hire this person in place of another that maybe has a um, a curriculum which is maybe with a higher higher education on everything but doesn't have this specific skill they need at the moment to cover this specific vacancy so yes it depends right right um just another quick question like yes. um like do you advise to apply for a traineeship before trying to apply say at the end of my phd for a position or a traineeship is also good a good opportunity uh, in in both ways. I mean, I mean, uh, because it lets you, it, it permits you to have a very insight of the work in the European institutions, and it is very appreciated also in the concours for permanent positions. So, if you have already worked inside the European institutions, it means that you already know how it works. So, right. actually. Yeah, having done a traineeship before applying for a concours, it's always a good thing uh, because, yes, uh, it justifies a lot of competence. You don't need to show them anything else. The fact that you have been selected for a traineeship and that you have done a traineeship, it means that you have certain competences. Also because the, the selection procedures for a certain traineeship is not easier than the one of the concours. Right. So, <laughs> so yes. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome.
And if I have uh, some questions possibly useful for uh, the students and the attendees, um, if I'm uh, not wrong, you mentioned the EU institutions and the different channels to get uh, a trainship there. Uh, but I was wondering uh, about the EU agencies, the decentralized agencies, um, I don't know, from Frontex to EASO. Um, they are much more specific, and some of our students, especially from the MIS, uh, they are expected to write the thesis in connection with their internship uh, experience. So, uh, being connected to a more uh, specific uh, professional milieu uh, could be good in terms of thesis too. So I was wondering that. Yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, and an experience in the agencies is is also a very good experience. You can find all the opportunities in the at the website I told you before. So. The traineeship page you will find all the places of the agencies but you can also visit the official uh, website of the agencies network and and here you can find also a page there is a bunch of vacancies and you will find all the, the the specific procedures because sometimes agencies follow different and specific procedures from the the, the institutions and here you can find all the information it is also a very a very good um, uh, a very good experience because this is very technical issues that are actually um, covered by by the work of those institutions okay. or those agencies goes. not institutions and the same goes for, for uh, the external action service the external action service and um, has okay you can apply for it in in different ways there are some traineeships which are organized by the external action service and you can find it on the web page of the external action service or also by in in the app store web page and yeah it depends by the single the single application you can go in delegations or you can go in the central offices in brussels and of course it's it's a wonderful experience as well and I think that external action service uh, organizes also some traineeship dedicated to students. So it can have maybe um, um, a maximum um, amount of uh, job experience in general. You, you could have done to apply. So generally, there are criteria so that you have to be a student generally. But it is not sure that in future will be published again those kind of competitions, but it happens. So, and um, yeah, check always the, the 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 EAS website because it has very interesting opportunities, and sometimes also the terms for the applications are very short. So keep it updated because, and maybe it is just necessary to send an email with your CV and with your motivational letter, and this, there is no uh procedure by forms and so on it's also very simplified per, uh, procedures in some cases so the external action service is always a, a good place and a very good experience because you can really travel and in that case of course uh, could be um as the knowledge of uh, also of other languages uh extra from the eu languages you know that the basic criteria only EU languages are considered. So when they ask you to know two or three uh, languages, they must be EU languages. But of course, in some cases, for, like for the external action service, they can tell you is very recommended the knowledge of another language, maybe the language of the place of the delegation you will be uh, you will be employed. So in this case, also non-EU languages are very useful. Any other question? Maybe the last question, uh, if I if I may, uh, because uh, in these days I am receiving several emails from students looking for uh, summer schools and uh, different uh, kinds of um, uh, practical uh, experiences uh, or training experience 
experiences. So do you know whether in parallel with uh, trainship opportunities, the EU uh, sponsors or funds uh, um, courses, uh, labs, uh, summer schools? Because uh, one I don't of know the about... problems raised by the students uh, is that uh, most of the summer schools, for example, are rather expensive. So. Um, I don't know about summer schools, actually. Yeah. I don't know if there is this possibility. I don't think so, but I cannot exclude it. Um, but not by the side of EPSO and not by the side of this. Um, yeah, the only thing is, are the, the traineeship by the side of, yeah, that we touch with our, with our job with EPSO. But I know actually that there is some... Uh, uh, programs for volunteering, all those cases of experience, which are actually shorter from uh, the, um, the traineeship experience and that are not con also considered in, in the amount of the weeks that you can yeah. have done. So they can also be very, very interesting opportunities. Mm -hmm. But they are separated from, from the channel of like uh, the, the selection procedures and the and the job and traineeship opportunities. Yeah, and there, like for for the students, um, there are um, uh, several opportunities in terms of um, uh, service in civil European civil service or uh, the equivalent. I, I, I'm not sure about the exact. Yeah, there is also a new program uh, called uh, Solidarity. Solidarity Corps. Is that so? Uh, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, but those opportunities are not managed by EPSO and by th those institutions. Uh, there are dedicated websites and dedicated different procedures. Maybe uh, if you're interested, you could ask to local offices, maybe like if you have a Europe Direct mm. in your province, usually there is a Europe Direct in your province, you can ask them. Uh, generally, they have all the answers about those kind of volunteering or, or, or generally project like summer project and so on. Generally, they're very important. Thank you, Francesco. So Thank you. if uh, there is no uh, additional uh, questions, so now more never, no, okay. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, again, uh, Francesco, and thank you. Thank you. Uh, to all the students joining us uh, this evening um, and good luck for your applications uh, and uh, have, a, have a nice evening ahead. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you both bye. very much. Thank you. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Okay, Francesco, se rimani ti saluto. Sì, sì. Okay. Marco, allora grazie, grazie mille. Grazie a voi, spero, spero sia andata bene insomma questo sì, esperimento. Sì, 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 sì. Mi spiace che... per il problema tecnico, ma sono connesso con il telefono perché sto avendo un problema al computer, quindi no, no, anche io no. devo... Curiamoci, capita, e gli studenti, soprattutto quelli che hanno seguito i miei corsi, uh, lo sanno, poi io sono particolarmente goffa con le tecnologie, quindi loro erano molto pazienti con me e, capito, sono temprati. <ride> e, va bene, grazie mille, ti faccio anche a te un in bocca al lupo grande per la prosecuzione dei tuoi studi. E, grazie. E, e niente, a presto, grazie mille. Grazie mille di nuovo, buona Ciao. serata. Oh.